This video is a response to A0101399's challenge concerning ERVs. What you call conclusions at the end of your video are really just assertions, but since English is not your first language, I'll just assume that you meant the latter. Now I'm going to start with your second assertion, that ERVs are not viral insertions, and I'll get back to the first afterwards. Let's start by defining a retrovirus. A retrovirus is a specific type of virus that uses RNA rather than DNA as its genetic material. It reproduces by inserting its genome into a host cell. The host cell's normal transcription and translation mechanisms then express the viral genes which build new variants within the cell. Finally, these variants bud from the original cell free to infect other cells. This diagram shows the genes of a typical proviral retrovirus, that is, after it has inserted into the host's DNA. There are several markers that are key in identifying this as a viral genome. First, we have the long terminal repeats, or LTRs, which denote the ends of the viral genome. Between these ends, all retroviruses share three major genes, known as GAG, POL, and ENV. In a mature variant, the genetic material and enzymes needed for insertion must be protected from the environment. The part of the virus responsible for this protection is called the nucleocapsid, a nearly impenetrable shell of proteins surrounding the viral core. The proteins in this shell are encoded in the GAG gene. Apart from this purely viral purpose, there is no known function for the GAG gene or the capsid proteins. This points to that gene being viral in origin. In order for the virus to be accepted into a host cell, it must fool that cell's gatekeepers into thinking that it's something else. This is achieved by glycoproteins on the viral surface. These glycoproteins are encoded by the ENV gene, another clearly viral process. The role of ENV genes in placental development is a secondary function as evidenced by ENV genes in ERVs found in animals that do not form a placenta, such as birds and reptiles. The third gene present in all retroviruses is one that is clearly and unambiguously viral in origin, the POL gene. Remember that retroviruses use RNA rather than DNA to carry their genetic code. In order to incorporate itself into the host's genome, this RNA must first be converted to DNA. This is the exact opposite of the normal direction of genetic transcription. In order to achieve this, the virus must carry its own enzyme, known as reverse transcriptase. This enzyme is encoded by the POL gene. If the retroviral DNA was not viral in origin, there would be absolutely no purpose for this enzyme, because it would have begun its existence not as RNA, but as DNA. Therefore, you wouldn't need an enzyme that constructs DNA from an RNA template, and hence, no need for a POL gene. Add to that the fact that POL also encodes the enzyme necessary to integrate the newly formed viral DNA into the host DNA, another unnecessary enzyme if ERVs were part of the host genome to begin with, and it's well near impossible that this gene was part of some original design. So this pretty much knocks out your second assertion, and if ERVs are viral in origin, it knocks out your first as well. Your third assertion, that ERVs occur in the same place in humans and chimps because proteins can only be functional in specific places, borders on absurd. Setting aside the fact that you have failed to demonstrate that all ERVs are functional, you're basically asserting that if a protein performs a similar function in two different species, it must lie at exactly the same locus in both species. Let's see if we can falsify this. Now you may have heard of an important little protein called hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is responsible for carrying oxygen to where it's needed and carbon dioxide from where it isn't, and so it's absolutely vital for survival. It's a tetrameric protein, and it's formed from four different polypeptides, two alpha chains and two beta chains. In humans, the genes for these chains are located on chromosomes 16 and 11, respectively. Now, the mouse also relies on hemoglobin for oxygen transport. Mouse hemoglobin, like that of humans, also has a quaternary structure of two alpha and two beta chains. However, the mouse genes for these proteins are located on chromosomes 11 and 7, respectively. And even when you account for large-scale syntony disruptions, the alpha chain is still in the wrong place. Mouse chromosome 11 maps mainly to human chromosomes 17, 5, 2, 7, and 22. 
If even a protein as absolutely vital to life as hemoglobin can show such variation in the positions of its genes, certainly an ERV, even if it is functional, could do the same. So this example puts your third assumption soundly to bed, and since your fifth assertion is based on the third assertion being true, it also falsifies that one. That leaves us only with numbers four and six. Now I'm not going to argue against number four, not because I agree with you, but because I only have ten minutes here, so I'll move straight on to your challenge. I think that assertion and that challenge are worth repeating here. You said, and I quote, Evolution is not falsifiable with ERVs. You cannot use ERVs as evidence for evolution if you don't provide a potential falsification. Challenge. Provide a potential falsification. How can ERVs falsify evolution? Now, you also said to define evolution beforehand, so I'll define it this way. Evolution is the theory that the diversity of life observed today can be explained by variation of heritable traits and natural selection acting on that variation to favor individuals better suited to their particular environment. Now such a mechanism will produce our old friend, the nested hierarchy. Whenever an ERV becomes fixed in a population, all descendants of that population will carry that ERV in their genome. If you trace the phylogeny of any group that carries a particular ERV at a particular locus, you will be able to determine a single point of insertion for that ERV that explains its presence in all the descendants. You can determine this separately for each ERV present in the genome. Okay, so what? How can this falsify evolution? Well, take a look at this phylogeny. If you try to determine a single point of infection for the red ERV, you'll see that it can't be done. In other words, it doesn't conform to the nested hierarchy. This would potentially falsify evolution. Now you might counter, oh, evolutionists would just move that second branch so that it's connected to the first and claim that it's not a problem. But I'm not going to do that just yet. Instead, let's add another ERV to the picture, one that again does not follow the hierarchy. Now, not only is it not possible to find a single point of infection for either the red or yellow ERV, but it is also absolutely impossible to rearrange the branches in any way that would put both the red and the yellow ERVs into a nested hierarchy. If such a pattern of ERVs in specific locations for distantly related species, which are absent in more closely related species, could be demonstrated, this would be a major blow against the theory of evolution. An example like this one, however, would not be enough to falsify evolution. Although the red ERV does not extend to every descendant, there are well-known mechanisms that could move an ERV to another location in the genome, and descendants on that branch would no longer share that ERV. Now, you said something else near the beginning of your video that I wanted to address. You said, and I'm paraphrasing, that ERVs are compatible with both science and creationism. Now, this might be true, but they still more strongly support the evolutionary model. If you don't understand why, I recommend you check out Urban Elf's video on Bayesian inference, which I'll link here. So I think that's pretty much it. I think I've successfully shown that your assumptions are essentially flawed, and that ERV evidence can indeed be used to support the theory of evolution, and it can indeed be falsified. Um, Feel free to respond to this, and I'll be happy to pick up this debate at a later time. Thanks for watching.